Welcome to Rebecca Sounds Reveille. I am absolutely delighted because I have got someone with me today who's got his master's from the Ohio University in interdisciplinary studies. This is really exciting for me. Also in physics, this is also really exciting because I've got so many questions to ask. And he's a television and stage actor. And I'm going to let him share with you about where and how, what he has done with this, because there is so much to tell. He's utilized this to bring education and entertainment to museums and libraries along with schools. And this is right up my alley because anything that we can use to instill and bring forth education along with embracing people's unique skills to propel them. Oh gosh, this is just something I absolutely love. And I'm really excited about this because he's also a lecturer, a photographer, and a writer. And I've got to tell you, what's really exciting about this is all of these things really kind of mold him into something very unique that is presented at the Charles Hayden Planetarium at Boston's Museum of Science. He has also branched out on his own, and I'm gonna let you tell him, let him tell you how he has branched out on his own, because this is really exciting, very unique, and it's brought him to really bring out something that I think you're gonna find that you're gonna wanna know more of and get involved with yourself. Welcome to the show, Mike Francis. Well, well, thank you very much. What a delight, because everything that you have done has really brought a smile to so many people's faces because your live performances really touch the heart of people. They get engaged, and in that, you're teaching them things that we need to use from the time that we're little all the way to the time that we grow old. And a lot of times people think, I don't need a history or a science lesson, and you're teaching it without them even realizing how important it is. How did you get started doing this? Uh, well, I started way back in graduate school. Um, my advisor was a, um, a physicist, and he had a TV program that he was trying to put together uh, called The Way Things Are, and it was about how things work. And I got involved with that and ended up doing my graduate, my, my, one of my graduate degrees on that, uh, which put me in a position, I thought, oh, I'll go to work at NOVA when I get out of here. Uh, NOVA didn't want me. But I did uh, get a job at the Science Museum in Boston. And so I got into, infor we call it informal education, where you're teaching, but you're entertaining. So uh, some people say I'm an edutainer. Um, actually, people say a lot of things about what I am. But uh, they, I love it. In, <laughs> they, they, uh, it, it's, it's a way of, of it, teaching people that aren't interested something that they probably should be interested in. And uh, I, uh, it, it sort of evolved. I, I don't think I intended it. It just kept happening. So now that's what I do. So were you interested in science, theater, and history at a young age? Or did this develop over time? I know for me, yeah. I, I just have to say this, Mike. When I was young in elementary school, neither of these things were something that caught my attention. I was interested in math and I was interested in entertainment and reading and writing. Those were my things, I loved it. And you know, math and writing and reading, those, those things go hand in hand. I mean, that's kind of the brain yeah. thing. Yeah. But now I'm fascinated by both history and science and I love it. I get in, I'm just, I mean, I'm drawn in. Yeah, I, I never cared about history. I was always a science geek. I was one of those kids that uh, I had a teacher, a physics teacher named Mr. Fredette. 
I thought he was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Everybody else in the school was petrified of him because he, he expected a lot and he made you do experiments and all this stuff I thought was great. I don't remember taking history. I know I took history. <laughs> I don't remember it. Uh, and I know I took a lot of literature courses, which would be in the theater and the drama I, end of things. I don't remember any of those. But when I, w I was in the service as well, when I was stationed at Fort Eustis in Virginia, it was just a few miles away from Williamsburg. I started to go to Williamsburg and all of a sudden I loved history. And uh, I didn't think about it for a long time. And then uh, while I was at the Science Museum, we had, my wife and I had kids. And when we had our second kid, it turned out I was taking my entire paycheck and giving it to the daycare. So I became a stay home daddy, well, but I had to think of something to do. So I started doing theater that was science based and it just has kept on snowballing from there. I love this. Thank you for your service, Mike. What branch? Army, US Army, Chaplain score. <laughs> I love this. Yeah. yeah, I was not a chaplain. But we were we were in the God Squad, and I was uh, a chaplain's assistant. And uh, the, the interesting thing was, I had and I hadn't been interested in theater until I was in the army. And while I was, I was at, one of my stations was at Fort Hamilton in New York. And when you're in New York, you can go to the USO, and they'll give you free tickets to plays. Yes. And I was there for six weeks, and I think I went to forty-five plays in six weeks. Uh, so I love theater, but I'd still never done theater. I had nev never, I don't remember even go, I can remember one play when I was a kid. Uh, we, I went, it was a Christmas play at school and I, I wasn't even in it. Uh, but I remember it. But then when I got to my final for, to Fort Eustis, uh, it turned out there was a little theater right across the street from the chapel. And I started going over there. I thought they could use a physicist, somebody that knows how to do lighting and do sound. And they said, well, you know, you should probably take an acting class so you know what's happening on stage. And I said, well, that seems to make sense. So I took an acting class. And then the director said, well, uh, you should probably at least do a play. And I said, well, okay. I thought I've, I had been on stage as a musician before, but never so I did the play and I got the lead in the first play and then I got the lead in the next play and then I got the lead in the next play and then I went back to graduate school and I got the lead in the next play and next play. And I became an actor instead. I so love this. This is so much fun and so colorful because this really just broadens so many parts of your life and really brings so much creativity because you can take all of these things and apply them in different ways. And then they transfer over to your audience and to mm -hmm. those who are learning. Because even when the audience who is watching from a television point, even the audience who's watching from when you're performing on stage, we're absorbing all of these things. And even if it's not an educated um, script, it's just something for entertainment. There's a learning, there's a learning curve in that. And so this is really neat because when you can even ad lib, you have things that you specifically are going to be able to deliver because of all of your experience and your knowledge. This is fantastic. This is, I absolutely am super excited about what you're doing and how you got there. And I've got to tell you just a little bit of my background. Okay, so I have some, a lot of common ground with you. I've got to tell you, I've got a lot of common ground. But the, the closest kind of planetarium experience that I've had is going to um, the Griffith part. Well, I have a little bit. I, I took some uh, college classes, but okay, so let me go back. Griffith Park Observatory, when I was a kid, we got to go to the laser light show, and that was a big deal for me, so I got to learn a little bit about that, and then, um, you know, I had some experience in astronomy in college, and so, boy, was this an exciting opportunity for me to learn. 
But there was even more that came along my way. And I will tell you, if things had been delivered in the manner that you deliver them, what a difference things would have made for me. But that is where I will tell you the interest really began because when you go to college, that was a decision that most oftentimes you made for your betterment. When we're in high school, we're there because it's a requirement that you most states require you to go. Your parents tell you you have to go. And college usually is a decision that you've made and you know you have to either take GE classes or you're continuing on because you want to go in that particular field. So we're there and we're absorbing. We're there, we're absorbing because we want to. And that's when things kind of opened up for me, but it would have probably given me a little bit more um, where it stuck a little bit more without me having to further it on after college as I began to want to know more. And I love what you're doing. Talk to me because you've, you have gone on, we'll talk about acting too in a minute, but I'm really, really interested in this because you have gone off and started something of your own in addition to everything that you do. Well, I've started a lot of things. <laughs> uh, so Galileo. The Galileo is, is my specialty. That's the one thing. Yes. And uh, I, uh, I have, a, in fact, when you talk about teaching, I, um, I, I did a program a couple of years ago, but there was a person there and he was, he was an elderly gentleman, probably in his late eighties or something. And he came up to me after and he said that he was an engineer and he said he thinks he learned more in my one hour program than he had learned in his physics course in college. Uh, which made me feel really good. Uh, so, so it is the kind of thing though that people when, you, when they're being entertained, they keep this stuff in their head. I, I'll have kids, if I go to a school, I'll have, if I say I go see the sixth, fifth grade, and the next year I go back to see another fifth grade, the sixth graders will come up and they'll tell me about something that I did the year before that they remember that applies to science or things like that. So it, it makes, it, 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 it's, it's like when you write down something, it, it helps you remember. Well, if you experience it, as, as though you were there with Galileo, it makes you remember things pretty well. Yes, and I think too, you've hit on a word that really grasps the concept of learning in the way that you described. And I say that because I know that digitally, we've come a long way in really being able to offer learning in a way that hits where we have these wonderfully digitally mastered cartoons and it's great. But not all of the senses are being awakened to make the imprint in the brain and capture those memories so that they do stay there, like you said, so that the person remembers. It's, uh, we call it, in the planetarium field, we call it immersive theater. And it, you really are, you're immersed in that. And when I do my living history programs, I immerse people in history. I take them back to the 17th century. Now, they may look around the room that we're sitting in and go, well, this doesn't look like the 17th century. But when they're talking to me, they start to believe that they have returned to the 17th century. Even adults, kids especially, but even adults will start asking questions that you would think nobody's going to ask that question, but they do because they actually believe that they're talking to Galileo. Well, that tells me two things. One, you're good at what you do, but two, you have a passion and love for what you do. And that is why you're good at it. Yeah, I, I, I like to think that's the case, but I also think a lot of it is that it's Galileo. Galileo was someone that he could inspire audiences when he did his classes. He did a, a lecture one time on the mathematics of Dante's Inferno. Now oh. people go, oh dear. And he had over a thousand people show up 
Now, this is before there were auditoriums with microphones and all that. And he had to come back and do it a second time because they had so many people waiting to get in. And I think that Galileo has a lot more, I, I attribute a lot more of my success to him than I do to me in a way. <laughs> this has to be very rewarding. It is, yep. Uh, it, especially, especially, especially when I'm doing the Q, I, I do the Q and A. A lot of people. I have a lot of friends. I have, I have friends like uh, Calvin Coolidge and Teddy Roosevelt and Amelia Earhart. Uh, a lot of them will do Q and As uh, in character, but most living history performers don't. I do, and I don't go out of character until I'm all done answering everyone's questions. And that's when you get the real feeling of, of interacting. And that's, that's one of the things, for me, that's the most rewarding part, is the Q&A. I absolutely love this. And I'd like to know, I've asked several stage actors who both, well, dual actors, they're television and stage actors, mm -hmm. what they feel is different or if they have a preference. And I already know which you prefer because this is your this is your passion, but I I just got to tell you. I can see how much that you just really be, you're alive in this, and <laughs> and this really outshines that. Is there if you were going to share with someone listening right now, and they were saying, well. What kind of, and I know most of us would say, go with what your heart is, but they're saying, okay, you know, I kind of want to go into acting. Would you recommend me to start in stage or should I try to go and take an audition and get on camera? Um, what direction should I go? What do I do? You know, I get that question a lot and it, it depends an awful lot on the, on the actor. I, I started doing theater out of the clear blue sky. I mean, huh. literally the director just he, after taking the one class, he said, all right, you need to get on stage. Um, and I think that stage is the best training ground because you have to bring that character to life over and over and over again. And for me, I've been doing, and a lot of my friends, even my actor friends don't know how I do this. I've been doing the same script now for 27 years. Um, and every time I do it, I have a lot of places that I go over and over and over again. And people have said, I don't know. It sounds as though that's the first time you ever said it when you say these things, uh -huh. but it's, it's the, the rep repetition and being able to bring life to a character using that repetition. Now, when you get to the film, you've got a, a whole different set of tools, but it's still bringing that character to life. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at both, uh, but you're right. I do really like being on stage. The other thing is I'm a solo performer. Most actors go on stage with a, an ensemble, at least three or four other people. If you get in trouble, there's somebody there to save you. If I get in trouble, I'm on my own. <laughs> You can't and, be like, oh, stage fright. Okay, what do I do next? Oh, yeah. but, no, but you've got this. You got this. And you you can handle this. But you brought up something. Okay, so you also have done acting on television. So let's talk about mm -hmm. the films that you have done. Oh, well, my favorite was because they were the best roles that I had is I had a couple of roles on Spencer for Hire back Oh, that's a long time ago now. Uh, but I played a uh, a bad cop. I was a cop who was uh, supposed to murder the guy that he was uh, guarding, Ooh. and I got in. I got into a, a a fight with Hawk, and it was it, it kind of a good story that goes oh, an interesting story to me. Anyhow, we're doing this fight and uh, rehearsing the fight, and and I'm talking to Avery Brooks, who was the actor that played Hawk, and I said this doesn't work. You, we can't have the fight go this way. And he said, don't worry about it. Just, just, just do it what they say. And I did. And uh, about two weeks later, I get a call and they said, can you come back? We want to redo the fight because it didn't work because they had him killing a cop. Well, you can't have this very tough black guy kill a cop and not have somebody get upset about it. So oh. I got to have the whole thing over again. 
And then my other episode of Spencer, uh, I, I, I actually was on it probably 20, 20 times over the years, but mostly as background. But the other one, um, I had actually had a little bit of a falling out with the casting people because I had had to leave an audition before they actually auditioned me because I had a show and uh, they, they got, somebody got mad at me at the, in the casting company. And I hadn't been called in for a long time and finally get called in. And they're, when I get to the audition, they're looking for a 70 year old short Greek man. Oh no. And I was 35 years old, six foot tall and finish. <laughs> uh, and I got the part. <laughs> uh, Okay, can I just stop right there? Because I want to share something really important with the audience. Because I always try to ensure that the audience is equipped with some things every episode. And this is one of them. Do not let something intimidate you. You might see a parameter that says, this is what we want. But that does not always mean that that is going to stop you from succeeding in something that you want to go after. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I just want to, I want to point that out right there. That's really, really important. Now you do have to be a little bit careful because if you go to too many auditions that you're not appropriate for, they'll get really mad at you. Sure. Uh, sure. But, but this I, was, this is kind you're, of you're right. Like it on anything in life, just yeah. really try to pursue what you want to go after. And there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different things that can happen. Just keep pursuing what you want to do. Yeah. And try to be the best at it that you can be. And hopefully that you'll be better than everybody else and you'll get someplace. I don't know yes. where, but because sometimes it does work to your advantage. Yeah. But just keep pursuing. Okay. Yep. So it's like, keep going, keep going. Oh, no, but no. One of the problems that I have is I get easily distracted. <laughs> So uh, people say I have a very short attention span because I, although I, I can concentrate at certain times, but I, I do get easily distracted. So we were talking about, oh, we were talking about the Finish. expensive for hire. And uh, so I did get that role. Yes, um, and uh, I've done a lot of others, mostly uh, uh, little independent films. Uh, then I've got one that's supposed to be coming out that I, I had a small role in uh, that, that I play a, a boat a harbor boat guy, the charge of all the boats in a harbor, and things like that. But I like I like doing small independent movies. Uh, sometimes you can get really good roles, and when you're in Boston, we usually don't get the big roles. We're always going to be a supporting actor, one type or another. So I like to do the little ones because then I don't have to be a supporting actor anymore. They are fun. The, yeah. the, the small independent films are fun. You get to really know the set you get to really interact with a lot of the uh other actors that are there you get additional parts sometimes you get to you really get to learn a lot about what goes on in the industry as well i i do like working with small independents you know, the downside is that oh, i work with some really talented young directors and as soon as they do a film here then they go to hollywood and never get okay. to do anything with them again uh that's they true. keep saying yeah so that's true maybe but, someday so talking about that too though that is knowing what your goals are i mean do you want to work small and just kind of maintain a, a circuit on independence or are you looking to pursue big screen too uh, i'm the the screen is 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 it more of a hobby it's a nice hobby because you get paid, although I get paid fairly well for my live shows because I've been doing them for so long in so many different places. But I really uh, am a, I'm a, a live stage actor first and foremost. So the movies I do, partly just to keep practicing, it, it, it's, you're stretching your your abilities you go and do things that uh you might never especially in the small films i can do roles that i might never have gotten cast in no matter what someplace else but in the small film i can do it i love this i absolutely love this and i love what you're doing i love where you're doing it what you're what you're doing i think that oftentimes we forget about where you can be absorbing education. Oftentimes mm -hmm. we think, okay, 
it's going to happen in elementary school, it's going to happen in our middle schools, it's going to happen in high school, community, college, university. Yeah. But you can get education library. in a library. Yep. We forget the library. Yep. And here in New England, we have a lot of libraries that are very active in doing, they call it outreach, it's programming. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I belong to a group called Solo Together, and we okay. have about, oh, about 70 or 80 members, over 100 different kind of programs, so that all the libraries in New England know all about the Solo Together performers because we are bringing that history, we're bringing that science, we're bringing that music, we're bringing that uh, literature, we're bringing it in and entertaining and uh, hopefully exciting the audiences. So uh, it's, it's, it's very rewarding in that sense and that the librarians certainly love us. And I think their, their, their patrons do as well. And museums, and museums. Museums. Well. Mm -hmm. Museums are hard because museums have schedules that they're, they're it's fixed, kind of uh, what they're going to be doing is, is you know, there are certain exhibits that are going to be there. Now, if they're going to have a Van Gogh exhibit, we could arrange to have somebody like uh, Postman Roulan, who was Van Gogh's mailman, come to talk to them. Uh, for me, museums... It's a little bit hard because I can only go to science museums, basically, although I love going to museums. I've been to the Air and Space Museum. I've been to the Carnegie Science Center and the Phil Franklin Institute. Uh, so I do like museums. And also, I, I was doing my show at a museum at the Franklin Institute a few years ago, and they were having a symposium of people who'd, writ who'd written books about Galileo. And they didn't tell me exactly that I was going to be doing my program at a symposium for people who had written books about Galileo. Oh, and, my. Uh, which is intimidating because you, you never know. You know, I'm, I'm sure. taking a lot, of, a lot of poetic license, shall we say. And uh, when I finish the program, that's one of the speakers, one of the principal speakers, I see him pop up in the back row. I don't think he expected much. He wanted to have a quick exit. And instead he came charging down at the stage and he came walking up to me and said, that's exactly what I thought he was going to be like. <laughs> so I was thrilled. It, it was probably, my, and I just wish that I could have gotten it on tape or something like that. Yes, but, you know, you please put a review on my website. And yeah, you, well, yeah. that was before, I didn't have a website, I don't think. I must have had it, but I don't remember what was going on at the time, but so, it was fun. You, okay, so... You're also a photographer, a lecturer. Now, do you sing? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I worked my way through college in a rock and roll band. That's why I wasn't new to the stage. I had been on stage a lot. We played, we, we were a mid-sized band. We weren't, well, we were playing the same venues as Jay Giles and Aerosmith, but we weren't well known. That was when Jay Giles and Aerosmith weren't well known either. Uh, but I had been, uh, well, I worked my way through college just by pay, playing in a band. So, and I did a lot of singing. So do you have an album? Do you have a track we can? Uh... No, unfortunately, that, there's some place and none of us can figure out where it is. There are recordings that we did during rehearsals, but you know, that was uh, 40 years ago, 45. It was a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> I can't okay. Even... Yeah, and did it, it, did it make vibes? I would love to hear it. Did it make Pardon? vibes somewhere? No, no. We the okay. only the, the biggest thing we did is we won a battle of the bands. We opened for um, the Trog. Remember the Trog Wild thing? Okay. We so, opened for them once, and we opened for a few bands, but we were we were a mid range band. We weren't okay. you know big time at all. I I was just hoping because. Right now, um, vinyl just happens to be popping oh. up in different places, and yep. people are saying, "I don't want this in my garage anymore." And I'll tell you what, maybe we could, you know, would have happened to been able to find this. So, okay. Yeah. Meanwhile, Mike, I'd like to know about your lectures. Talk to me about what you do, where you're doing your lectures. Well, my lectures are the, my planetarium programs. I'm uh, in the old school. 
of planetarium people. We do live, pro I only do live programs. And my programs are basically, well, I can have a lot of subjects, but the, basically it's what you'll see if you go out that night. So, in fact, that's my, my dome right behind me. You can see my dome back there. Uh, and that's what I could take in. That's set up in a library. I don't remember which library it was in. But I will you know, teach them a little bit about the sun, a little bit about the moon, a little bit about the planets, uh, if there's a comet in the sky or a meteor shower in the sky. And it's a pretty straightforward science uh, astronomy program. And uh, I, I, I spent years at the Hayden Planetarium where we did the big multimedia shows. And I, I loved those. But I, I, I guess it's because of my live stage thing. I really like live interactive planetarium shows more. I, I can understand that. I absolutely understand that. I can embrace that. And I also want to say for those who can take your lecture and your class in this to do it because there's nothing more than really being able to utilize your senses see it grasp it and then be able to read it and get it i took a class i think i shared with you off air and having to try and figure these things out on my own and you know it, it was really difficult and yeah um if I would have, I mean, been in a group and we're there looking at all this together in a, an area like what you have there in the background, wow, what a difference it would have made. And not an app. I, I really tell a lot of people how different it is when you're writing, when we use our hand, our brain through our arm down to our hand, our sense of smells, our eye, when we're using our senses, our learning is different as well as the creativity that comes from those things and what happens things boom and i don't want to knock technology too much because we do we we have developed and advanced so much from it but there we really need to not forget that component and how much we can really get from it and you're doing it and i absolutely love this i am just i just am so excited about what you're doing and i, I really want the audience to have an opportunity to see all of the things that you're doing every part of it is i mean just aside from and you may be doing things for toddlers i don't know but it sounds to me like just yeah. about every age group is something someone can can really learn something from what you're doing this is this is something you don't hear very often yeah that's the nice part about doing the small planetarium programs like my dome back here um that i can literally do programs i try not to do it for kids under three mainly just because unless they're with their mom or their dad because it does get dark in a planetarium and all you have to do is have one little kid get panicked in the dark and now you've got 10 little kids crying but i've done it uh i i even had uh i did a program a few years ago at a library and uh i had three ladies that were octogenarians and they were they said that they were at the high end of the octogenarian range and uh, when they saw that they have that you have to crawl in through that tube you can see and they said we have to crawl in through the tube and I said uh, well that's the way you get in and they said well this is gonna be an adventure <laughs> and they came in and they they loved the show so uh, I, I literally have done from nine well I even below nine probably from three to 99 year olds I think this is fantastic. One other thing before I share with the audience how they can get in touch with you, find ways to get involved with everything that you're doing. I mean, there is something for everybody that's listening today. You can see it, learn it, feel it, touch it. I mean, this is what you're doing is absolutely awesome. I think that they need to see your show. If you're in a learning environment, they need to be there to really get that. You're going to get an A in the class. I know it. <laughs> and, um, but talk to me a little bit about your photography also. And do you teach photography as well? 
I have not been doing photography a lot lately. I, for 10 years, when I was at the Science Museum, I was a staff photographer. Uh, and so we used to do, we had 100 slide projectors, which all have to talk to each other and line up with each other. So I would do those, that was the kind of photography I was mainly involved in. Although I've done portraits, I've done, I used to do a lot of theater photography until I realized that when I was doing theater photography, the theaters were saying, well, we want you to do the photography and I got too many of those and I wanted to be on the stage and I didn't want to go, I didn't want to mix the two. So I stopped telling them I knew how to do theater photography. Um, so I, I really haven't done that much of it. Uh, I, I mean, I still take pictures, but nowhere near. I, I imagine there were several years when I would have taken 100,000 pictures in a year, uh, which is a lot of pictures. <laughs> that is absolutely a lot of pictures. Yeah. But well, very, very well-rounded in all of the things that you're doing. I am absolutely impressed with the skills that you have, the passion that you're sharing with everyone. I will tell you, Mike, it's been a pleasure and an honor to meet with you and to be able to share with my audience what you're doing. Thank you so very much for being here. Will you please share with my audience every way you would like them to get in touch with you? Okay. Well, the best way is to go to my website, which is pretty simple. It's Mike with a hyphen francis.com f-r-a-n-c-i-s um but i'm also on facebook and that's stars science theater and uh oh i don't i i should do a better job with twitter and uh things like that uh and uh, that's a little bit uh uh it's probably not the best place to try to get in touch with me because I may or may not notice it, <laughs> but definitely go to my, go to my, uh, my website. And uh, now I'm up here in new England. I do get around the country with Galileo, but uh, if you can't come to one of my planetarium shows, I hope everybody will at least try to go to a planetarium show near them. The planetariums all across the country are just a, a major, uh, treasure that we need to take uh, better advantage of. I love it. Thank you so very much for being here and everything that you're doing. I, I just can't share my appreciation enough. So thank you, Mike. No, you're welcome. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in to another episode of Rebecca Sounds Reveille. With me today is the prolific Mike Francis. I've got to tell you, so excited again i just am i'm ecstatic and i hope that you are too i hope also that you had an opportunity to hear all of the little things and big things that you can get from this episode to apply to your own world please check out his websites mike-francis.com you can catch him on all of the different social media sites and if by chance you didn't catch it um that way contact me and i'm going to get you in contact with him you definitely need to connect. I also ask that you uh, subscribe and share this episode with everybody you know, your friends, your family, your loved ones, and everybody you don't know. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>